Well, coming up on today's show, VW's new CEO in the US says the tipping point of EVs is already here. Sales jump in South Korea of those eco-friendly cars. And guess who Pininfarina is turning to for that EV tech they need? I'll let you know soon. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily. Boom! It's a brand new week, Monday 10th of December. Here we go. Going to be a big week this week because Formula E starts this weekend, but more about that later in the week. My name is Martin Lee, and I've been through every EV story I could find over the weekend, whittled it down to the ones I think you really need to know about. And here we go. Thank you to myev.com for, as always, helping make this show. You know, they've built the world's first marketplace specifically for trading EVs. Do you want to buy an EV and you've been working out the best place to go? Maybe you've got one to sell because you're moving on, moving up maybe. And maybe at the moment you're EV curious, but you want to learn and research. All in one place, myev.com. Now, some major executives at the big automakers still insist that EVs are years away from being the mainstream. And it's even harder to sell them the traditional vehicles with gas tanks and, and tailpipes. VW's American new CEO has done wonders with the Audi brand in North America. And now it's his responsibility as the CEO of Volkswagen of America to sell us EVs, because that's the future of the company. He is definitely not one of those doubters, by the way. In a roundtable interview with Green Car Reports and some other news outlets in the last week of the LA Auto Show, details are coming through of what he said in these press interviews. He made clear it's ready for the millions of mass-market EVs that VW intends to produce, and they're ready to go, according to Bengt at Green Car Reports. According to Scott Keogh, the reason that Tesla is at the top of the sales charts is that no matter what the price or the market segment, the automotive business is driven by what's new. Well, have a think about that. Do you agree or disagree? He's obviously someone who's very senior in the automotive world, but he says the automotive business is driven by what's new. That's kind of an interesting thing to sit with for a little while. Well, let's hear from the man himself. Scott Keogh said this, and I quote, There's no debate. If you climb into one of these vehicles, it feels like you're driving the future. If you want to launch a marketing campaign, you want to target new customers, and it's the come drive the future. Well, a lot of people will listen up and tune into that. I've seen it with products. I see it happening here. I'm a firm believer, and the reason it's going to happen is because they're going to feel like they're driving the future and driving what's next. And that is the universal truth of consumer goods, end quote. So he's really got his finger there on the pulse of what makes people put their hand in their pocket and pay $1,000 for a mobile phone, by the way. And that's interesting. A few articles over the last couple of weeks, because I don't just, I'm not just fascinated with EVs, but I am kind of a tech geek, shock horror. I know you'd never guess, would you? And so I've been following the, the rise and rise and rise of Apple very closely. And then more recently, the, the wobble that is happening at Apple, Apple and a lot of commentators and journalists are looking at the latest iPhones, by the way, and saying, Actually, people are no longer as fascinated with the new because there's just not enough new. The products are so brilliant that it's really hard to iterate on them and make something that's genuinely making people go, wow, I've got to have the latest and greatest thing. For instance, I always had, I don't know, I'm a sample size of one, but I digress. I've always had the latest iPhone. Apart from the first one, I, I came on board with the second iPhone. I wasn't there with the first one. I was on an, an HTC, like a, not even Android, like a Windows thing. And then I came on board with the second. I've been an iPhone ever since. But my phone now is the iPhone 7 Plus. And you know what? It's good enough for me. Do I particularly want facial recognition? Nah, not really. Do I want a massive screen with the notch? Nah, not really. And I'm like a super geek, and I'm not upgrading my phone, and that's why they're seeing the shipments of the iPhones, maybe not in the, the numbers that people are expecting. Anyway, let's get back to cars, should we? Hyundai and Kia and their eco-friendly range have seen a big jump in sales. 
Sales of eco-friendly cars made by the Hyundai Motor Company and its sister company, Kia Motors, jumped twofold in the first 11 months of the year. On strong domestic and overseas demand, industry data showed today, according to the Korea Herald, the two flagship companies of the Hyundai Motor Group, the world's fifth largest automotive conglomerate in terms of sales, reported selling 257,000 hybrid EVs, plug-in hybrid EVs, pure electric cars, and the odd fuel cell vehicle. At present, Hyundai and Kona uh, and Kia have six uh, hybrids, four plug-ins, plug-in hybrids, five pure EVs, and one fuel cell model in their lineup. A total of 16 environmentally friendly vehicles. The companies said that they uh, the spike in EVs comes as demand for EVs of the Kona, Hyundai Kona, and the Kia Nero have both been picking up pace. I'll put a link to that article in the show notes. Today, I've been, um, let's say, sowing the seeds of the Kia e-Nero uh, with my wife. Because I think that's a it's a gorgeous car. And I always get in trouble when I say gorgeous, by the way. I, I, I call nearly all EVs gorgeous. And then I get emails going, it's not gorgeous. It's not a roadster. I... I you know what I mean? It's a, a, look, The range on the 64 kilowatt hour Kia e-Nero is spectacular. And I would love one. And they're going to go on sale very soon. And I can wait till April. There's going to be some changes happening for me next year, which I can't share with you yet, but I promise they're good. The podcast will continue. And it's... Uh, f- it- for me, it's life-changing what could be happening, what is what is happening next year. And it'll mean a little bit more driving for me, actually. And that means I need to pick up a car. And so that's the big debate at the moment. Is it a certified pre-owned Tesla Model S with free supercharging, which means all my fuel costs would be free? Or is it one of the new generation? So I can't wait for Model 3 because the changes that are happening to me are going to be early next year. But maybe it's one of the other... Kind of second generation EVs. So I've been wearing uh, wearing my wife down. I've been persuading her. We need one, and she's not been not been convinced. And today we saw the Kia Nero, but the hybrid, and she loved it. Absolutely loved the shape, the style, everything. Perfect, great family wagon, and she was sold. So we'll see what happens with the E Nero. Anyway, I'm just saying that I'm I'm one of those customers potentially <laughs> that they could be selling a car to. Moving on, an automobile Pininfarina will... Uh, I just think you have to say the name with some pizzazz, you know. Automobile Pininfarina is going to partner up with the new US startup, Rivian. And they're going to develop a family of SUVs together. Rivian had an amazing couple of weeks, by the way. They're going to make a pure electric FP1 that's going to ram- r- rival the Lamborghini Urus, said motoring.com.au. And according to Autocar in India, they broke the story two weeks after Rivian unveiled the R1T and the R1S, uh, the truck and the SUV. Uh, Pininfarina has switched technology supplies. They were using Rimac, and they're not anymore. They're now going to use Rivian for its SUV. Pininfarina believed to be well underway into the development of its PF0, and the company's... Um, wild pure electric hypercar uh, with the Croatian hypercar maker Rimac supplying the motors battery technology and control model modules look like that looks like that's where the partnership will be with um, Rimac rather than Rivian so using both but certainly not for the SUV uh, using some of uh, Rivian's off-road expertise they've been developing right three more stories to go on today's podcast and we'll start with some elon musk tweets elon's been tweeting about autopilot development explaining that traffic lights stop signs and roundabouts are all items that are currently in testing as tesla vehicles go about understanding the world around them in an effort to navigate on behalf of the occupants understanding and being able to cope with complex environments is key to reaching autonomy says tech au yeah can you imagine what has to kind of go through the brain of a uh, of the ai when you're at a traffic light so all of that data has to be processed if the light is if it's if it's red and all around the world Traffic lights have subtle differences in terms of the sequence of colours and and all those kind of things. If it's on red, stop at the stop at a line, and then if it turns yellow, 
work out what speed are we doing? How far are we away from the intersection? Should we break or go for it? <laughs> you know, all these things that you'll do as a driver and a roundabout as well. So you go to a roundabout with four or five exits and you get a roundabout with two or three lanes. I mean, that's mind bogglingly complex. And it's in testing right now. It's huge. Uh, Elon said today on his Twitter account, if you have a Tesla built in the last two years, definitely try and navigate on autopilot. It'll blow your mind. Automatically passes slow cars and takes highway interchanges and off ramps. Already testing traffic lights, stop signs and roundabouts in development software. Your Tesla will soon be able to go from your garage at home to parking at work with no driver input at all. Full self-driving option is required with the Tesla-designed Hardware 3 computer. It's a simple plug-in replacement for the NVIDIA version, which used to ship and does ship, uh, but it has over 10 times, 10x, the image processing ability. We're moving on to a new review of the Audi e-tron, and three out of five stars is not what I would call a ringing endorsement. Evo slightly unconvinced with the Audi e-tron. Uh, they sum it up at the end by saying you'll pay £71,500 for the entry-level e-tron. And, of course, you get the UK government plug-in grant for that. You can also do the 82000 launch edition, which comes with lots of equipment and more bonus things as well. But that's 82000 Starting at 63500 is the Jaguar I-Pace, which can't match the Audi e-tron for practicality or space, but they say the I-Pace is way sharper to drive. Well, prices then rise to £74,500 for the flagship model in the I-Pace. What about Tesla? Well, the Model X and its distinctive gullwing doors, seven seats, but the price, well, that starts at 79 here in the UK. It's by far and away the most expensive proposition than either of its smaller rivals. And if you want something with a motor in and some electric, well, the Porsche Cayenne e-hybrid is worth consideration. 27 miles of pure EV range, but you do have that 3-litre V6 petrol engine, and it rivals the I-Pace as an SUV that's decent to drive as well. So they're saying the competition there for the Audi e-tron is, in many ways, a little bit too good for it. If you want sharper handling, they recommend the iPace. Have a look at that article. I'll link through to it in the show notes if you're interested. And finally today, one of these little stories that I love. I was tweeting about it earlier yesterday, and I just love these little tidbits of information that kind of come out of nowhere. And you think, ah, oh, right, we know it's not going to change the world, but it's interesting to know. In a new series of tweets on over the weekend, Elon was talking about some trivia with the company history. Faraday was actually the alternative name proposed for the company, not Tesla. Faraday. Well, it was the alternative. They had a backup, if you like. Uh, it was before Tesla Motors was even purchased. Now, they purchased Tesla Motors' name for $75,000. And a chap called Brad, Brad Stewart, had filed for the trademark Tesla Motors back in 1994. And he even maintained the registration of it all the way through until he sold it to Elon's company in 2004, according to Astro Jane at Tesla Rati. Also, in subsequent tweets, Elon was talking about the domain, which you, you remember, teslamotors.com. And he wasn't keen on it. And he wanted Tesla. And it took... $11 million to acquire the domain tesla.com and 10 years of negotiation and $11 million to get tesla.com. A, a quick search, if you do search Tesla, by the way, in the US trademark database, reveals hundreds of goods and services paying tribute to the genius of Nikola Tesla. Uh, and so many people use his name with uh, with with his uh, uh, association, as, as it were. So, interesting. By the way, also over the weekend in the interview clips that we saw, he was even... It, they even asked him, do you prefer it, Tesla or Tesla? And Elon does slip into Tez with a Z, or a Z, uh, a lot of the time. He, he, he slips into Tesla. And if I say it, I get emails saying, that's not how you should say it. It's an S, it's a soft S, or a double S, it's a Tesla. So I try very hard uh, not to offend the hardcore fans. Thank you for listening today. Thank you to myev.com for helping us make this show and setting a brand new question of the week, which is brilliant when you think about it, because we've been setting these questions of the week all year, and now 
it's your turn. Here is your question from us to you as we head into 2019. What's on your mind? What would you like us to ask the rest of the audience? Question of the week next week. So what would you like question of the week to be? Come on, give me your feedback. You can email the show, hello at evnewsdaily.com, and you can go online to myev.com, click on research at the top and answer on question of the week there on the discuss pages. And if you want to use the YouTube comments, you can do that as well. There are 131 patrons of the show who keep us going. Patreon.com slash evnewsdaily. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And there's been a rush lately on the $10 a month support. So thank you very much. Seems to be a very popular level. Kind of a posh coffee once a month. You know that maybe you'll support the podcast instead of treating yourself to a cappuccino. And by doing that, thousands of people around the world every day get to learn something a little bit, maybe be entertained, you know, a little bit, we hope, on this podcast, which you get every single day of the week, of which there are 321 shows online for free, wherever you get your podcasts from. If you want to subscribe, it means you haven't got to think about downloading it. You've got enough to think about, let's face it. Just hit the subscribe button on any of your platforms and you'll get it first and free and automatically. And in return, if you can leave me a little review, that would be amazing. Catch up on the socials sometime today by searching EV News Daily. Do have a wonderful day. I will catch you tomorrow.